again, it's good to be back with everybody in the study of the book of John. I'll go back over some of the things that we said last week by, and bring our minds hopefully up to ready to move on into the material for this evening. I think you'll find that uh, some of what we'll say this evening uh, sort of is a background to what Brother Ken was dealing with in his devotional message of this of this evening. But before we get to that point, uh, let's keep in mind what we have or bring back to our mind what we studied last week. Uh, we noticed how that Jesus told them that they were to love one another. And he did not make that an optional matter, but that they were commanded of him to love one another. And he says to love each other as I have loved you. He also pointed out that as the world had hated him, so they would hate the apostles. And let me emphasize again here that these verses are dealing with Christ's speaking privately and personally to the apostles that he had chosen for a specific work. He points out that they should not feel set upon and uh, opposite from what is right because if he suffered, they suffer because a servant's not greater than his master. He also emphasizes in verses 22 through 25 that the world is accountable to the God who made it. And as far as he is concerned and the proof that he is the Messiah, especially this concerns the Jews, that they were without excuse. And he had done all that was necessary to prove that he is the Messiah, the only begotten Son of God. Now he comes down to the end of this particular chapter. And we introduced again to his comments regarding the Holy Spirit. And this is where I say we're getting some background material that might help us some on what Ken was dealing with. In verses 26 and 27 of John 15, but when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. Then the next verse, verse 27. And ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. Now, I'm going to spend some time uh, on the matter of the Holy Spirit and his relationship to the apostles, which we've introduced earlier in this book, the design of which is to prove the deity of Christ. John had said earlier that they would not be left comfortless. But the Comforter, verse 26 of chapter 14, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Again, let me remind you, and I give great emphasis to this, that our Lord is addressing his disciples, and more particularly the apostles of Christ, relative to the reason he called them to be the ambassadors of the court of heaven. He is the king. He will be, at the time they come into their own as apostles of Christ, sitting and ruling at the right hand of God over God's kingdom, as Peter, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, declared in Acts chapter 2. Yet the early church, as 
you're familiar with. When it came into existence, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Well, that tells me something. The apostles' doctrine is nothing less than the doctrine of Jesus Christ. But how did they receive the teaching of Christ? Well, they received it through the agency of the Holy Spirit, the third person, the Godhead. Now, I want to remind you again that when he talks about this business of the comforter, that that is an English word that translates the Greek word parakletos, and many times commentators just anglicize it and call it paraclete. And I didn't say parakeet. I said paraclete. And this is that special relationship that the third person of the Godhead had with the apostles of Christ to give them the wherewithal that they needed to do what Christ called them specifically to do. Now, if you look back earlier in chapter 14, and we've already, I know, covered these at least at the time, but I want to spend more time with it now. You'll see after he says in verse 15 of John 14, if you love me, keep my commandments. He then says, and, and connects what? If you love me, keep my commandments. And there's a coupling pen. I, Christ, will pray the Father, and he shall give you, the apostles, another comforter. Remember what we said about that last time? You can't have another car till you had the first one. Well, they had had a comforter. They had had a paraclete with them, but it was the second person of Godhead, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, in the flesh. But now he knows that he's going to die. That's what he came to do. Be tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin, as a lamb without blemish could be offered. He was, as John declared of him, behold the lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. So he would die on the cross, a sinless sacrifice. And thus he could die on behalf of others. And that he did. He offered his body a sacrifice. It knew no sin. And he shed his blood for the remission of sins. And anybody that becomes a Christian must contact the blood of Christ. There is, as the song says, power in the blood. It has the power to cleanse one of sin. It's the only thing that can do it. So the Holy Spirit is going to guide the apostles who don't understand a lot of what I just said at this point when the Lord's talking to them. He's going to guide them, as we've already read too, into all truth and give them infallible remembrance of everything he said. Now, that's an amazing thing. I don't know what that's like for sure. But he says that he would pray the Father. And the Father would give them another comforter. And let me remind you again the best way to understand the relationship of the Holy Spirit to the apostles of Christ is to understand the relationship Jesus Christ and the flesh had with them. And I think I pointed out, too, that he would come to them. But how would he come to them? Through the agency of the Holy Spirit. That's why that you can talk about the New Testament of Jesus Christ, and yet it's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. It's all one and the same thing. So he's telling them that they will not be left alone. They will not be left alone. But he must go away so that the Comforter can come. Notice the emphasis that's given in verse 17 of chapter 14 is even the spirit of truth. This is the great emphasis given to the work of the Holy Spirit, getting the truth of the gospel into this world, 
confirming it to be from heaven and not from men by miracle signs and wonders and guaranteeing all of it to be set down infallibly. That's what the apostles were busy about doing as ambassadors of the court of heaven. They spoke on behalf of the king. That's what an ambassador does. He's an official representative of the position of the government of which he's a part. And that's the apostles. The apostles are doing today through their writings exactly what they did when they walked this earth. That's why Paul could say to the church at Ephesus that when you read what I wrote, you'll understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ. And so we see this is the beginning of this relative to the work of the Holy Spirit in giving us gospel truth. The gospel is God's power to save, Romans 1, 16. So I pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Now, it's interesting to note when it says the world cannot receive, uh, doesn't mean to receive him as the apostles received him. It means that they can't take hold of the Holy Spirit like they could take hold of Christ. That's the idea. And sometimes that's been misunderstood because of the word receive. But they could take Christ, and they did. But they cannot touch the Holy Spirit who will be with the apostles for as long as they're on this earth to do what Christ called them to do. And that's the point that's being made here. But ye know him where he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. And then notice verse 18. I'll this is a repeat of it. He says, I, Christ, will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Well, he came to them, let me emphasize again, for them to be able to do the work he called them to do through the agency, the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, in this relationship invisibly that he had with them in the flesh. Now, with that in mind, look over here at the end of the chapter. Chapter 14, verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, you can't get clearer than that, whom the Father will send in my name. Now, he said, I would pray the Father, and he, would, he will give you the Comforter. Now, he says, the Father will do this in my name. Well, to do anything in the name of Christ is by his authority. Why would that be here? Well, remember in Matthew 28, 18, Christ declares, all power or authority hath been given unto me. Now, who gave him that authority? Why, it's the first person of Godhead, the Father, in whom all authority inheres. He delegates this authority to the Son. So therefore, it's by the authority of the Son, the Holy Spirit is given in his paraclete relationship to the apostles for them to be able to do the work that Jesus called them to do. Notice what that is. And you'll still see the truth aspect of the work of the Spirit with the apostles is greatly emphasized. Notice, he shall teach you all things, as I said earlier, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever, I have said unto you. And I think it's interesting, verse 27, as we noticed the last time we were on this, immediately he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. They're going to receive what allowed them to go through all the ordeals and persecution trials and tribulations that uh, would be by human strength alone unable for them to bear. And this is what the apostles are going to have 
when you read through the book of Acts, you can see this happening when they have various things happen to them. And yet they go right on. I think of one that just came to mind when Paul is shipwrecked and gathering sticks for fire and snake comes out and bites him, but it doesn't bother him. And I might point out here that that is one of the things that was promised for this miraculous age, the infant stage of the church, when it comes to the work of the Holy Spirit with the apostles. And we won't mention right now, well, we'll mention it, we won't go into it right now. The apostles could lay hands on members of the church and impart certain miraculous gifts to them. So if somebody might have the gift of prophecy, well, it would be somebody like a Luke who was not an apostle, therefore did not have all the apostolic uh, powers. But he could write by inspiration, thus he had to have the gift of prophecy to be able to do that. How did he get it? He received it through a laying on the apostles' hands. Now, looking in Mark, as Mark closes out his account of the gospel, he plainly says in verse 17, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now mark that, but come right on down to verse 19. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Now Peter declares that when he finishes preaching, as would the other apostles as they were speaking under the direct guidance of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. But now watch. And they went forth, they who, the apostles, and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. What was the Lord doing? And confirming the word with signs following. I thought the Holy Spirit was doing this. But you see how this ties back into what was said earlier when the Lord said, uh, I will come unto you, yet he's talking about praying the Father and the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, would come to the apostles to enable them to do what he called them to do. So you've got to realize that those uh, passages are talking about the same thing. But now back over here to John uh, 15. We have mentioned what was covered in John 15. And at the end of this, I'll take up here with the matter of the Comforter, verses 26 and 27. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father. Now notice, I'll pray the Father and he'll send them to him, but I will send him to you, or he, he will be sent in my name. Now I will send him to you. So you see, it's all the same. Deity is at work. What one person of the Godhead does, deity does it, or God does it. So I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. Now again, this is the Parakletos, third person of the Godhead, and his work with the apostles to enable them to do what Christ called them to do. Thus, it is Christ via the Holy Spirit working with the apostles to be with them as long as they're there to do that work. Now, notice that the Holy Spirit would testify, give evidence that Christ is the Son of God. But then notice this in verse 27. And ye also shall bear witness. Well, why? Well, they'd been with him. Because you've been with me from the beginning. Now, you can see this, as I've pointed out sometimes when we were teaching from 1 John. Now, John was one of those apostles. John wrote what we are reading here in the Gospel of John. John received the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit. He had the parakletos relationship with the Holy Spirit. And notice what he says as the Spirit guides him to write 1 John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. 
for the life was manifested, and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Do you see the connections? Do you see the work of the Spirit with the apostles? A lot of people today will go to these verses and will speak of them as they apply to us. That's resting the scriptures, W-R-E-S-T. And that word actually means to torture the scriptures to make these things apply to all Christians is to simply torture the scriptures. They were said by Jesus to the apostles concerning the comforter, the paraclete, the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, and how he would take the place invisibly of Christ who's going to go to the cross, die, be buried, resurrected, and ascend to heaven. And Christ then would come to them to give them the wherewithal to do what he called them to do, called them to do, but he would do it through the agency of the Holy Spirit. So when we look at this, as we move on into verse, well, chapter 16, and I'll be dropping back on more of this next time together. But I want to end up with verse uh, 13 of chapter 16. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me. For he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and show it unto you. Now, take note of the fact of the masculine pronouns. You hear a lot of these people today trying to refer to God, to she, 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 or maybe some neutral way. Well, the Holy Spirit ought to know what he's talking about. And if you believe in the verbal, plenary inspiration of the scriptures, and all of it's inspired of the Holy Spirit, every word is given by the Holy Spirit, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, then God is called he. He's not a human being, but that's the way God chose to be called. And I think I know one reason why. It's the ultimate reason. He indicates headship. She does not. It's not to put anybody down or anything else, but God's not going to be called by something that makes him lesser than what he is. And language has to be used to refer to him. Thus, he, not a force, not some sort of thing like that. Some people teach Holy Spirit's just a force. But here you can see regularly that, uh, or in reality, that it's referring to him as a person, the third person of the Godhead. There is, as Paul said in Ephesians 4, one spirit, even as there is one Lord, and even as there is one God and Father of all. So we'll stop here tonight, and if you have any other questions on the relationship of the Holy Spirit with the, with the apostles, I would leave you with this. The emphasis is given as to what the Holy Spirit actually and ultimately accomplished through the apostles. The spirit of truth, that's what he was doing, working with the apostles. And the apostles' doctrine is the truth. And ultimately, it's the truth that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him. That's the gospel truth. Well, we'll close here, and we'll close with a word of prayer. Our Holy Father, we're bowed before thee again humbly, so thankful for thy good word that enlightens us, praying that thou wilt help us to walk uprightly before thee, 
even as thy word leads, guides, and directs us. May we strive daily to grow in greater knowledge of it and the application of it to our lives. Help us to honestly and objectively examine ourselves to see whether we be in the faith and help us teach the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth on whatever it is that pertains to thee. For we pray it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen.